Jim Wilcox. I am the uh, proud owner of a Sandler Performance Center here in Fort Wayne in South Bend, Indiana. I am joined by my esteemed colleagues. Uh, we'll start with Mr. Tim Berry. Go ahead and introduce yourself for those who don't know you. Hello, hello. Uh, I am Tim Berry. I own the Sandler Performance Center here in Fort Worth in the great state of Texas. Uh, happy to be here as always and ready to rock and roll. We got a good topic today. So, and I will uh, now introduce or turn it over to Mr. Vanderslice. Well, jacked up today, Tim. That's good. I like it. <laughs> Tim's, Tim's, Tim's rocking and rolling here. Uh, good afternoon. I'm John Vanderslice and I own um, a Sandler Performance Center here in New Jersey, uh, the southern part of the state, very near Philadelphia. Yeah, so thanks for having me, as always. Absolutely. All right, the topic today, gentlemen, is behavior tracks. And uh, I want to start out by talking about what a behavior trap actually is. And uh, wh what I found interesting is that, you know, in doing research actually on the term, behavior trap is, is a term from the 70s, it comes from psychology and education and it was really first used to describe how um, psychologists and, and educators especially might gamify a situation to produce a more desirable result. In other words, if somebody was having undesirable, undesirable behavior, what is a way that we could trap them into a better behavior or a more desired behavior? So that's actually where the term comes from. Uh, not sure if you guys knew that. We throw that term around a lot. I know that when I'm talking to John or Tim on, you know, different Sandler calls, accountability calls, we, we throw behavior trap around. But did you, did you guys know that term and where it came from? 19, I did not. 1996, I believe, Jim. Just 1996? Is I that when you first learned it? Somebody can Google that, but I think that's when, I forget the two guys that came out, it was in a psychology class I had, but you, as always, were dead on. There you go, excellent. All right, so why would we need a behavior trap then? Tim, John, why, why do oh. your clients need or why would they benefit from a behavior trap? I think, uh, I think the answer, of, at least for my clients and even in my own experience, is that uh, it's easy in this world of technology to get uh, tied into knots with several other competing priorities. Uh, a lot of times when you've got uh, a bunch of people reporting to you, their problem uh, becomes your problem. And if you don't set yourself some behavior traps, uh, you can easily get distracted. I see that a lot with uh, people who are managing big groups of people and they, they get sidetracked all the time by the people that poke their head in the office and, and say the, the, those magic words, hey, you got a minute? And it, it's never just a minute and it, it derails productivity. So behavior traps are important for folks that are, are managing people so you can stay on track. Okay, very good. John, how about you? Why would you or your people need a behavior trap? You know, I think it's about, uh, you know, I think it's about forming habits and mm -hmm. uh, and goals. So I think um, I think behavior traps are really useful. And essentially, I know we're going to talk about this a little bit later uh, in your presentation, I believe, Jim. But um, I find for me, and it, it, it and part of the psychology too is depending on how you're wired, whether you are um, seek gratification or you avoid pain, uh, mm -hmm. the way you set those traps can can kind of incent behavior one way or another. And I think it's a, it just kind of gives you a guidepost or something to be shooting towards. Um, and then the, the interesting thing about it is when they did this in psychology, they said, set those traps, make them fairly easy to, to reach. But then once you do it, it reinforces the behavior and then you, you tend to repeat it. So it's very good for setting up a repeatable process. Absolutely. Absolutely. For myself, it's many of the same reasons, right? If I look at myself as a business owner, uh, there are a lot of competing priorities, as Tim mentioned. Uh, it's very easy to rush to check things off the list, um, but I've got to be careful of 
uh, how that time is managed. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But what I want to do first is I want everybody to get their chat fingers warmed up and answer the following question in chat. What behaviors do you see people engaging in, whether it's yourself or people that report to you, what behaviors do you engage in that distract you from what you really should be doing in your day or in your week? So what behaviors do you engage in or do your people engage in that distract from real productivity? Go ahead and, and throw some thoughts in chat right now. And I would love to see what you guys think on this topic. What are those things that you get wrapped up in that distract from productivity? So Tim, John, let's talk about ourselves for a second. What do you guys get involved in that distracts from what you really should be doing? I think one you know, of the, uh, me, I, tend go ahead, John. I tend to get caught up in YouTube videos at times. Not so uh -huh. much during the work day, uh, in the middle of the day, but yep. I, uh, I'm a kind of a compulsive researcher, so I'll see something and it can distract me for a little bit where I'm like, oh, I, I wanna go you know, check that out. Maybe something about technology or a, a leadership trait or tactic or something. And I'd really be better off leaving that stuff in no pay time. Uh, but sometimes I find myself uh, getting caught and saying, ah, no, I shouldn't be doing that now. Yeah. There you go. Uh, I'd like Mac, you know, researching too much. Yeah. Some great comments in chat, checking email, fixing another team member's work, uh, being concerned with what others are doing, uh, doing things like uh, politicking, news updates, um, absolutely. These are things that distract from real productivity. So one of the fundamentals that we talk about in Sandler and what we do is this concept of pay time and no pay time. Uh, we call this pay time versus no pay time. And it's very similar to the things that you put in chat. So I want you to continue uh, with putting some stuff in chat if we look at the left side of this graph, no pay time activities. These are activities that do not produce meaningful revenue for the company, uh, meaningful results for the organization or ourselves versus those activities that do. And we'll talk about that line down the middle in a minute. But when you look at this, what are additional no pay time activities? We've got some good examples here uh, Adam says sleeping. Hopefully that's not during the day, Adam. Um, or talking too much versus what, you know, I can actually get done. Amy has a great one. Uh, coffee breaks. What else are you guys seeing in chat that, that has stood out to you? For me, I think, uh, and I, I fall victim to this occasionally, not as much anymore, but, but just responding to every email that comes in as it, as it pops up, as the bubble pops up on my my phone or, or, you know, it interrupts my, my, uh, my work concentration. So, so that's one thing that in the past I've gotten, uh, I've fallen victim to. So let me ask this question of the two of you. Um, I think I know the answer for John. So I'll start with John. Do you have an audible or a visual email notification on your, on your device, on your phone or your laptop? I do. Yes and yes. Okay. Yeah, it's not, it's Tim, not Tim, how about you? Yeah, I do. Okay. So something to think about as we, you know, as we, uh, as we move through this talk, Amy put an interesting one in there that says coffee breaks. And I'm not sure how I feel about that, Amy, <laughs> with uh, <laughs> coffee because coffee is mandatory. But the, when we look at no pay time activities, right? being distracted by email. Uh, so largely I have my email notification off because for me, I end up like Pavlov's dog. Every time that tone goes on, I'm looking, you know, where's my email? Where's my email? Got to get to it. Um, it could be apps on our phone that distract us, certain hallway conversations. Now, if I pass Tim in the hallway and we're talking about a strategy for moving a deal forward, I'm not sure that's no pay time activity, but there are certainly ones that I may be having or non-essential tasks that I may be getting into that are really avoidance behaviors, right? They're, they're really distracting me 
from what we want to do from a sales or sales management perspective, and that is finding, qualifying, and closing opportunities for the organization. Other examples, gentlemen, from uh, no pay time activities that we get involved in? Yeah, I mean, for me, I, you know, it's, it's interesting, you know, when you work from home, and I'd be curious, you know, how people feel about this, you know, a lot of people thought, oh, it's going to be so much easier working from home. Uh, it's not really, I mean, you're, it's kind of like, and we say in business, in organizational excellence, profitability hides a lot of sins. I mean, I think those yeah. no pay time activities really show up and you really, really realize that you can, you know, you can waste some time, but if you, if you can eliminate these no pay uh, time activities you've talked about, Jim, and people have spoken of, I mean, you can be highly, highly efficient working virtually uh, under the right set of circumstances. So I think these are all fairly common. And I think like anything yeah. else, we tend to slip at times and, and fall back. I know I do. Uh, I want to take think, a moment and uh, go ahead, Tim. Sorry. No, I think uh, one of the things in this uh, COVID world that, that we live in is, is a lot of our kids are not back in school physically. And so that can definitely be dis a distraction and, and, and take us away from the, the pay time activities. There's, you know, some technology issues that I've been hearing about in regards to some of the online, online classrooms and stuff like that. So these are, they're real things that uh, real impact to, uh, you know, the way we're being productive while we're working from home in this COVID world. Absolutely. And I want to preface one thing as we look at this. You know, if we eliminate every single no pay activity, uh, no pay time activity, it's likely going to be pretty dull at home and or in the office. And so we've got to have some semblance of culture. And I'll give you an example of this. When, when I was a client of Sandler and we learned about pay time versus no pay time, and we started to examine it and take it seriously, I was at a place where we had very much a Google, you know, type of culture where, you know, we had a pool table, video games, ping pong table in the office. It was really easy to get distracted by those, you know, fun things that were hanging around the office. So um, it's not that we didn't ever want to do them. We did, but we managed them differently. And we'll get into that in a minute. So in the vein of uh, continuing to define, right, pay time activities include, include things like prospecting, networking, sales meetings, right? Meeting actually with prospective clients or clients, um, targeted LinkedIn activities. So one of the things is, you know, if I'm just on LinkedIn reading for the sake of reading things that are interesting might be avoidance behavior. But if I'm targeted, reaching out to people, sending targeted messages, that might be considered pay time activity. So these are things that produce sales opportunity, sales revenue, expansion opportunities, et cetera. What are some things that I might be missing here? This is a short list. There's, a, there's obviously a lot more to consider. I think the uh, the number one thing you know for me is is that the the point number one for you is is the prospecting. So you know managing mm -hmm. my time, uh, you know to make sure that I'm a actively busy, uh, you know doing the things that are generating new revenues, and and those are those that's my my highest priority in order to have a functioning business. You've got to continue to fill that pipeline and and be disciplined and not being distracted constantly. John, what about you? Yeah, no, I would agree. I think, you know, in prospecting and depending on what we, in Sandler, we talk about, you know, you want to have at least a three-legged stool, you know, and preferably mm -hmm. a five-lane highway of activity. So I think, um, you know, it's interesting. Cold calling historically has been a low-yield activity. Even if you're good at it, it's, it's, it tends to be a bit of a low-yield activity. It works very well for some people. But what we're finding today in this environment it's actually a little more robust because people are more likely to answer their phone. They're more likely to be available. So I think, you know, things like cold calling, I spent a lot of time this morning reaching out to clients that have downloaded white papers from my website, right? Keeping in touch with people. These are all things that are, are productive, you know, during the week and during the day that we, that we can't do in the evening, nor should we, right? 
Nobody wants to get a, a call at home, but there's other things we can do if we think about prioritizing that can be pushed off into that no, into that no pay time. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So as we look at this, there is um, a line in the middle between pay time and no pay time activity. And we've got to keep, um, I'm inclined to say balance, but it's not really a balance. I want things weighted to the right side. And we often say, stay to the right, uh, right side of the trouble line. And the trouble line is that line up against no pay time activity. So we want to really look at our day. And, and one of the exercises that we do uh, here in our offices in Fort Wayne and South Bend is we'll have people go through the exercise of list out your activities Monday through Friday in the past week of what you actually did. And now let's rate them. What produces revenue? What doesn't? invariably those activities are heavier on the left side. And so the question becomes, how do we actually keep our activities on the right side of the trouble line, right? How do we do that? Because there's so many things that we convince ourselves that they're uber important and we've got to take care of them. Email is one of them, right? Email is one of those things that gets us into trouble because we have a fear in managing email. I mean, how many times have you heard the email tone go off or you see that you've gotten an email and you feel like, oh my gosh, I've got to respond instantaneously or I'm not being uh, a good servant to my client or my prospective clients. I might miss an opportunity. So what I want to do is take a couple minutes and talk about how we can manage behavior traps to increase our own productivity. And, and the first one is just that, manage your email. Now, if you email me right now, you will get an auto reply that says something to the effect of, your email is very important to me. However, I am with or servicing clients. I typically check email at 10, four, and at the end of the day, I will respond to you at my earliest convenience. If this is an emergency, call my cell phone and I give my cell phone number in that auto reply. That for me has been a game changer because uh, Tim John, guess how many times my cell phone has rang with somebody needing an email answered urgently? I would guess it maybe just, once. Yeah, it just doesn't happen. And those people that do call my cell phone, I'm happy to answer it, right? So if I see a call coming from uh, a prospective client or a client, I will answer it or I will respond very, very timely to them, but it's helped me manage my email. So are there other things related to email that you guys have done to help you manage the distraction of email? No, and I, I Jim, you know, it, it's an interesting thing, right? Um, I used to, much like you, I checked, I used to, when I was in the corporate world and really in, in my Sandler career, I would check email at 10 and two. And that was, I did the same thing as you, but interestingly, somehow, as a lot of things happen, right, we backslide and I stopped doing that. And we, wanted, we all wanna be responsive to our clients, uh, but you're right, when we think about it, it's that, it's that FOMO, fear of missing out. We're afraid we're gonna miss mm -hmm. something. So um, I, I think it is, it, it, I think it's a great idea and it's a basic uh, and sometimes the most basic things uh, yield the biggest value. So I think this is a, this is a home run for anybody. Absolutely. Second one is set a penalty for yourself for not achieving a goal that you set. So John referenced cold calling earlier. If Tim's making cold calls and he's going to be self accountable and he doesn't hit his dial goal for the day, what's the penalty that you could impose on yourself, Tim? What, what could you, question. what could you tell yourself? Well, I, I mean, I could always make an excuse that, oh, I'll just add it on tomorrow, but that never seems to quite happen that way. So, uh, you know, I, I've been, uh, I, you know, I've been making myself uh, put 10 bucks in a, in a, a fun jar uh, if, I, if I miss the goal. And it might sound kind of silly because I don't usually miss them, but uh, it, it'll, it'll add up to a dinner, you know, every couple months. So it's, uh, it's just a little trap that I set aside for myself. So John mentioned earlier, understanding if you're pain or pleasure motivated, 
uh, for me, um, in that regard, it would be pain motivated. So if I had a dial goal and I were competing with Tim, my behavior trap, for example, would be I've got to put $10 in a fun jar. And when that jar gets full, that donation goes to charity in Tim's name. Now, that would set my competitive juices on fire because I would not want to do that. If I'm going to make a charitable donation, I want it to be in my name from me or my company. And that's just a little fun trap that I set for myself because I know that, you know, I'm, I'm pain motivated in that regard. Anything to add to that, John? Yeah, because it says when I saw that, I, and I think this is where you have to see what works best for you. Um, mm -hmm. I, for me, uh, rather than a penalty for not making, I like to set a reward for making it uh, over time. Um, you know, for example, my wife and I, Christy, decided about, oh gosh, six weeks ago that we were going to walk every morning. And we've been doing it now for six weeks and started out, you know, 4,000 steps, you know, whatever. Now we're averaging about 12,000 steps a day. And it's really fun because we've kept it going. And the reward yeah. is I look at the scale and go, oh, crap, I lost four pounds. So I think yeah. you have to think for yourself, are you better off for you, a penalty or a reward? And, and I don't think either one matters. It depends how you're motivated. But for me, it happens to be re I'm reward motivated. I have a client that bought a special sports car a few years ago. And he came to me and said, I need to use this. Um, as, as a behavior trap, how do I do it? And I said, well, does it pain you more? Uh, do you get more displeasure out of not driving it or more pleasure out of driving it? He said, well, that's an interesting way to look at it. He said, uh, I smile from ear to ear when I'm in it. And then I said, that's easy, right? If you don't make your goal, I'm sorry, if you make your goal, you get to drive your car. And he went ahead and used that. And I'll tell you what, he hit his dial goal because he was so motivated to drive that car. And it killed him the first time that he had a week where distractions got in the way and he wasn't able to drive it. So I thought that was a great behavior trap to set for himself. Steve Phones uh, so made a great question. He said, would you suggest behavior-based or outcome-based goals or reward penalty, reward uh, for me, I think it's behavior based. Uh, I'd be curious what you two gentlemen think, but I reward myself for doing the behavior consistently. I don't necessarily reward myself for the result. The result is the reward for me. Yeah, John, I, I agree with you on that one. The behavior is the leading indicator. The reward is the lagging indicator. If you're not doing the behaviors to generate that, that, that and to achieve that goal, uh, you know, I don't know, you can get lucky. I mean, let's face it there. We've all seen those, uh, those salespeople that were, you know, average at best, but they'd hit a home run at the, you know, in, in the, the fourth quarter and, and make their yearly number. Mm -hmm. doesn't make them a, doesn't make them an effective salesperson. It just means that they got lucky. So uh, execution of the, the behaviors is, is really the driver right there. Absolutely. And I agree a hundred percent on that as well. Behavior based. The last one is block everything out on your calendar and treat it with the appropriate importance, right? So one of the things that we see, the number one mistake, you guys want to guess what this is? Um, what is the number one mistake we see related to that fourth bullet point that I just put up there? Look back at that fourth one. Block everything on your calendar and treat it with the appropriate importance. Number one mistake, making it, uh, making, said it earlier. Making the block wishy-washy so it's, it's negotiable. You're not protecting it. So whether you're a sales professional on this call or you're a manager on this call, right? Number one, um, when I ask you the tough question of, if I were to look at your calendar today, would I see prospecting activities on it? And that's a question I ask you know, all of our sales professionals here would we see it? Now, Clarissa, thank you. She said yes. Um, so proud moment there for me. So absolutely. But what happens is even for people, so Clarissa, the next question then is, do you protect that time? 
as much as you would a brand new prospect meeting. And that's the number one mistake that I see people make in relation to this is we say, okay, I can shift that. And the moment we shift prospecting activity, it loses all of its importance, right? Now, I'll make an exception there. If I have a 1 p.m. prospecting effort and the only time I can meet with somebody is at one o'clock, I can shift that down in my day as long as it stays in the day. But the moment I move it to the right of my calendar, I might as well erase it because it's lost its importance. That's the only exception that I'll give there. Not sure about you guys, but um, you tend to agree with this or do you see something different in terms of how we handle prospecting activity? No, Jim, I, I, I think this is a, is a critical one because again, uh, somebody put it in chat, uh, Clarissa, Clarissa actually said it, uh, you allow others to control your time reactive versus proactive. And every, this is what I said right in the beginning, everybody's emergency is going to become yours. And, and if you're not protecting your calendar block in, in your time in your calendar, uh, you know, everyone else's issue is, is going to interrupt you and take you out of the pay time activities. So defending mm -hmm. your calendar is something that I've become real militant at over the last several years. Uh, it just, you, you have to fight for it. Like your business depends on it. Yeah. One thing I might suggest to people uh, to help get a little more granular, especially the C behavioral size will, will like this. I found it very helpful for me. Uh, it's called an Eisenhower matrix. You can just Google that Eisenhower matrix, some Dwight Eisenhower. Uh, and also Stephen Covey called it a priority matrix. Just look at those two things. They're the same thing, just different version. And I think it really helps you get a little more granular with your time and your activities. It really gives you some clarity and will really help you get this set up. It's called an Eisenhower matrix or priority matrix. Check that out. I think you'll find value there. Absolutely. And we want to spend our time in the important but not urgent, right? And that is where working on the business happens. That's where strategy happens, et cetera. So great suggestion there, John. Um, I put a couple interesting cartoons in here uh, just as a wrap up for this. We've got to be accountable to ourselves. Otherwise, we're going to be made accountable by our circumstances. If I disregard my most important pay time activities, I'm going to face the consequence at some point. Pipeline's going to dry up. The opportunities are going to be gone. Um, I call it riding the roller coaster. Things are good when you're coming over the crest of the first hill, but then when you get to the bottom, you get that sinking feeling in your stomach, right? As you come down and go back up. Um, I, while I love roller coasters, I don't want to ride one in my business. Um, so for me, it's all about personal accountability. What do these things say to you guys as we wrap up here? Love the yellow one. That's a great one. <laughs> as as that. It is. That's a great one. Yeah, Absolutely. And, and just to be clear too, I know you're a hard charging guy. Uh, and you talk about the, the kids, the study, you know, kids are still at home from school. It is not a strategy to put the kids up for adoption. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> Don't anybody get the wrong right. idea, Tim? <laughs> um, <laughs> I've thought about it once or twice. I'm not lying. Enthusiasm, but let's not lead anybody astray. Yeah. That's awesome. All right. Oh if you got God. questions about behavior traps, how to set them, uh, doing a better job of pay time versus no pay time, keeping right of the trouble line, reach out to us. Um, our contact information is here. Screenshot it, jot it down. Uh, if you don't know us, we're happy to help. Uh, thank you for taking the time with us today. We will see you guys next week on uh, our next episode of the uh, Wednesday Grab and Go Growth Tactics. Awesome. Have a great day, everyone. Great All job, right, everybody. Bye, Thank everybody. you. Gentlemen, great job today. We will talk to you soon. Thanks, Jimmy. Talk later. Bye. Thanks, John.